How many in here were looking for verse 2? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm thinking, whoa, 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 oh, it's over. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Good to have you this morning. It's good to see everybody out on this Sunday. It's a beautiful time to be in church today, and I welcome you in the name of Jesus. For those of you that are watching via Facebook, welcome to join us here at Chandler's Grove today. Thank you for coming. God bless you all. I hope the Lord will bless you through our service today and the moving of His Holy Spirit. Uh, I'd like to take a few moments so that we can look at maybe some uh, announcements that need to be made. I've got one here I want to read to you. Mrs. Rebecca Lukadu cordially invites you to attend the Eagle Scout Court of Honor for Nathan Hall, Saturday, February the 11th at 2 o'clock at First Presbyterian Church of Gastonia. A reception will follow. So we congratulate Nathan, and uh, I don't know, is he here? No, he's not. Okay, so the scouts are just taking over, aren't they? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Anyhow, but congratulations to Nathan. I think that's wonderful. Are there any other announcements? Does anybody have any? Kathy? Ladies, continue to exercise, and the men continue to shovel in the food. <laughs> yeah. For February 1st, it's the next week, February 6th. Okay, okay, that would be Wednesday instead of... A week from this week. The February okay. 6th. Watch for further information. <laughs> yeah, okay. You know what? It just gave me an idea with two microphones, we could have dueling microphones. <laughs> and uh, one starts off, do, 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 do. The other one, yeah. And then one would say, no, that's not right. Okay. All right. Any other announcements? Yes, Patty. Good morning. Uh, administrative Council meeting uh, this Thursday night, 7 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. And then February 8th, we have our uh, first information session. This will be about the Global Methodist Church so that we'll be able to make a more informed decision about where we go as a church. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other announcements this morning? Uh, Mar Margie? I forgot this one. Uh, Carrie is sick, and because she's got COVID, and because of that, normally we meet on the first Wednesday for the ladies' fellowship. So that's canceled. We'll we'll take up again next month. So for right now, no meeting. Any anyone else? Yes, Bill. I just want to thank all the men that came out Thursday night. We had uh, 24 men at the meeting, the uh, men's fellowship, and it was really good. We had a chili cook-off. I hate to brag, but I won the chili cook-off. Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> uh, let, let, let me explain to you how Bill won that. He was not only the promoter, he was the only judge. <laughs> but anyhow, the next one will be the fourth Thursday of February. And we're having a good turnout, so uh, we also had some guests there last night. That's one thing to remember. It's not just for the members of the church. You can invite a neighbor or friend or whatever to get them here. It's men's fellowship. 
not Chandler's group, so try to come out each time. We really had a good time. We missed all of you that couldn't make it, but uh, I'll announce it next month. Community table is has not been getting quite as much uh, food from Food Line. So if there's anybody that wants to donate dessert, we will welcome it. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, if there are no other announcements, uh, let's all stand and let's tell everyone that you meet. It's good to see you. Good to have you in church. May be seated. Thank you, church. At this time, I'm going to give an opportunity to share any prayer requests that you may have. I would like to relay a message to the church from Bert uh, Wooten and from Jody. Uh, Bert uh, wanted everyone to know how much he appreciates uh, your phone calls, your prayers and uh, however else you have uh, reached out to he and, and uh, Jody. Uh, there is, uh, we definitely need to continue to be in prayer for Jody and, uh, and pray for Bert also. You know, uh, that's uh, tough 
uh, you know, when you're trying to, whether even though he wouldn't admit it, but it's, t it's hard trying to travel, you know, an hour and a half to and back and forth and stay three and four nights, uh, you know, trying to be close. So um, we need to continue to pray for her. She's got a journey, uh, a tough one ahead of her. So let's be in prayer for J Jody and for Bert. Anyone else? And uh, also, I want us to continue to be in prayer for Brad, Hardy, and uh, his whole family uh, during this time at the loss of his mother. So let's be in prayer for Brad and Aaron and the entire family. <coughs> Anyone else? Yes, Tom. Good to have you back. Uh, I have a nephew in <coughs> Gainesville, Georgia, who had an aneurysm and has moved in. Now he's had a double heart attack all at the same time, and he's just in his 60s, and I pray for him. And I'd also like to pray for the people in Israel. They've had two killings over there in the synagogues, mm -hmm. wounding people and killing seven. I don't care what church it is, where it's at in the world. That's just Satan on the move, and you better believe he is. So let's pray for those people, too. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Greg. Yeah, I want to ask the church's prayers for uh, our cousin, Mikey and Carly. They live uh, down near Charlotte, and um, they already had three boys, and they unexpectedly found out they had a fourth on the way, and about 20 weeks in, they found out there was some problems <coughs> with the baby and asked her to terminate the pregnancy. They're very strong Christians. They refused to do so. The baby was born last Tuesday, and he's got some parts of his brain are not there at all. And um, but he's moving everything, and he's, uh, you know, he seems to be there's still all the signs that he's had since he's born seem to indicate that he, you know, feels everything, he moves everything, and that so. There's a big range of where this kid could be, evidently, at the end of the day. So let's just pray that he's as far on the part of the range that we would want him to be and, and for his family. Again, just super Christians, and they, they tried to do some other invasive tests on her. They could have found some other things that was also wrong with this baby. Also, it turns out he has spina bifida. But she would not allow the invasive test after they had already asked her to terminate the pregnancy. So they just found all this stuff out when the baby was born. So hmm. he's got a journey. And um, yeah, he does. that could turn out, you know, either close to normal or really, really bad with a short lifespan. So we just ask that God do what he's doing there for that family. And thank you guys for your prayers for Nolan is his name. Nolan Helms. Thank you, Greg. We'll be in prayer for both of them and that child. What's the baby's name? Do you know? Nolan. Nolan? I missed that part. Okay. Mm -hmm. Eva? Yes, I would like for y'all still going to pray for our, for both of our son-in-laws. Both of them need some prayers. But the one in Charlotte, he went to rehab. And let's hope it's going to work. So he got good days and he got bad days. So. And then I got a message last night to see how the messages get uh, mixed up. Carrie called me and told me to tell you all the work for uh, the prayer for the Hutton family. H uh, Dave's mom got COVID. The rest of them don't have COVID. So, but they went in the nursing home back and forth and back and forth and put them in different rooms. And then Carrie told me, she said, guess what? She said, I got COVID, but Dave don't. So he's upstairs and I'm downstairs or vice versa. She said, tell the church to pray for the Hutton family. So. Okay. Thank you, Eva. We will. Lisa. Uh, yes, I'd like to ask for everyone's continued prayers for Sharon. Uh, she had her stress test Thursday and she found out Friday she didn't pass it. Um, she has some heart problems, uh, so 
and she still has to have something done with this uh, lung cancer. She talks to the surgeon on Wednesday, and she said, I don't know why he wants to talk to me because I can't do surgery because of her heart. So just keep her in your prayers. She has been through so much over the last couple of years. I appreciate it. Anyone else? By the way, that's my oldest daughter. If you've not met her, this is Rebecca. <laughs> hey, Rebecca. <laughs> okay, Please go, re remember. Reba, good to have you back, and uh, glad you're better. <clears throat> by the grace of God, Billy's not bouncing back. No, he's not a bouncer anyway. <laughs> But please continue to remember Billy in your prayers. We will. Thank you. Thank you, Reba. Anyone else? Yes, Winfred. I have a couple unspoken. All right. Are there any other this morning that might have an unspoken? Just raise your hand in faith on behalf of this person or persons. Anybody else? Okay, I'm going to go. If anybody would like to join me, I'm going to go in, uh, to the altar, and we're going to all pray together, okay? Loving God, we give you thanks that we can come this morning and lift up these people that have been mentioned for prayer today. Lord, you know the circumstances in their life. You know the difficulties that they, are, they find themselves in right now, whether it be physical or emotional or spiritual or all three. The ones that are spoken and the ones that are on our, our hearts this morning that we we put before your arms of grace as we pray our prayer. Lord, we lift up the sick and we pray for their healing. We lift up those that are discouraged, Lord, that you will speak to their hearts to encourage them and increase their faith. For those who are just questioning and they really n are not sure what they believe, O oh Lord, bring clarity and help them to see where they were not able to see. Lord, we lay our sins at the altar for those things, Lord, that we need to let go of in our own life. We give them to you and we confess them and we ask for forgiveness. We pray, O oh Lord, for our church and our church family, for our whole community. Lord, for the people of this community, Lord, bless them and speak to their hearts and meet their needs. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that we have the privilege to serve you every day as your disciples, as your followers. Gracious God, fill us with your Holy Spirit. As we open up the Bible today, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will open up our ears and our mind and our hearts to receive your truth. We invite you into our hearts and we give you praise and thanksgiving. Lord, I thank you for all things, spoken and unspoken, of those who have come to this church today to be a part of this worship service. Meet their every need. Give them a hope. Stir their hearts. And we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
Did your knee lock up on you? I don't know what happened. Okay. All right. Hold on. All right. Yeah, just give it a minute. Is it your the, is the pain in your knee? Your le your legs. Okay. All right. No, you no, you you were supposed to come today, Kyle. This is this is your day. Amen. Yeah, thank you. Did I tell you that's my daughter? <laughs> Just, I didn't know if I mentioned it. Uh, I'm glad you're better, Kyle. All right, maybe he'll be able to come back in here in a, in a little bit when he starts to feel maybe a little better. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask our ushers if they would come forward and receive his tithes and our offerings. Lord, we give you thanks that we can give these gifts that will go to the work of the kingdom of heaven. We thank you, O oh Lord, our God, for you and you only are holy and righteous and good. You know all things. You know our hearts. You know our intentions. You're all powerful. You're in every place at, every, at all at one time, Lord. And for that, we give you praise, and we stand in awe of you. So today we give our offering to honor you, and we do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Change in the 
For those of you that are here for the first time, I want to welcome you, especially uh, I would like to apologize that uh, hopefully next week the choir will sing a really happy song. <laughs> yeah, that, that's even better, isn't it? Yeah. They're sitting in the back. Who's that woman up in the front saying all that? Uh, this morning, our scripture lesson comes out of the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to go to verse 36 of the seventh chapter, and we're going to read through verse 50. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house, and he took his place at the table. And a woman in the city, who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what kind of woman 
this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and he said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts of both of them. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown a greater love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him <clears throat> began to say amongst themselves, who is this? Who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. To set this story up a little bit better, I want you to listen to verses 31 through 35. Just These are the verses right preceding uh, that passage we read this morning. To what then will I compare the people of this generation, and what are they like? They are children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say, He is a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Nevertheless, wisdom is vindicated by all her children. I read those first few verses because I think they describe many times who we are in our generation. If somebody were to ask you, how would you describe the people of this day and time, would you say that they are very mature, mature adults who seem to have good wisdom? Or would you say they act like children? How many in here have ever acted like a children even though you're an adult? Yeah. We do that, don't we? When our ego gets bent a little bit or maybe our feelings get hurt, we're sort of like the guy in the community, he's the only one that has a football. And then when his team doesn't win, he picks it up and says, I'm going home. And you're going, wait a minute. The rest of us can't play. I don't care. And he goes home pouting. That's what we do. We pout. We like to find that dark place and feel like the whole world is dumping on us. And we cry and we act like children. And that's what Jesus was trying to relay, you know, that there was this Pharisee whose house he went to, his name was Simon. But he was giving them instruction of what we're dealing with today. He was saying, you know, John comes, he wears all kinds of strange rough clothes, he eats locusts and honey. So his diet is a little bit shaky. You may be, honey's okay, but eh, I don't know about the locusts. You know, he, he is a, a Nazarite. His mom and dad even said he would be a Nazarite. And a Nazarite, they had a special code that they follow. It's very strict and very disciplined. They didn't have any alcohol whatsoever. 
But Jesus, what he did he do at his first miracle is he turned water into wine. Now, it wasn't grape juice. It was wine. And that's what they would serve at weddings. He would fast and he would uh, do without his diet. Like I said, wasn't really broad. But Jesus would sit down, even at a Pharisee's house, and he would eat. He went to Zacchaeus' house. Do you remember that, that story? He was a tax collector. So he would indulge just like most other people. But neither one did the so-called religious leaders lift up as a good example. They complained about the one who was doing without. John, he's a wiry guy. He's scary and he's strange. He was a critical spirit. Then likewise, they did the same thing with Christ saying, look at this. This man calls himself a teacher, a rabbi, a prophet, and yet he is sitting with sinners. He's eating supper with sinners. What kind of religious man is this? Does this sound familiar to anyone? Have you ever spoken to somebody or got to know somebody that it didn't matter who they were speaking about? It was always negative. There was always a negative spin. There was always a critical spirit. Have you been around somebody that just has a critical spirit? It's constantly criticizing. You ever wonder what's wrong in their hearts where they feel that way? Where they're always finding something wrong. It didn't matter who they're talking to. They could find some complaint. That's what's happening here. But there's far more than that happening here (laughs) because what we have is a story that exposes us. See, one of the things that, that, that the religious leaders did not like about John and about Jesus was that their words would bring light into dark places. Their words would expose the hypocrisy of the religious leaders who claim to be so holy. And it's like all of us, none of us in here, when somebody speaks truth to us and the truth sort of hits us and he's speaking about us without speaking to us, they see a light coming into a place of darkness where they've been hiding. And they don't like it. And that's exactly what was going on here. You know, the light will expose the sin. We hold on to our sin. We make excuses. You know, uh, it's sort of like how people feel sometimes about coming to church. They get this idea that if they come into a church building, like I have said before, somehow the, the floor is going to swallow them up. And so what will they do? They'll tell you when you invite them to go to church, Well, you know, maybe another day I will go to church. And on that day, what I will do is I'll I'll get myself straightened up. I need to get all straightened up first. And so we have this idea that we need some time maybe to just go into a, a private place where we can start to get right with God and start to confess all our sins so there are no surprises when the preacher preaches a sermon. And that way I will not be banished or shunned or uh, what they call up in the mountains, churched. That means being sent down the road. You ever talk to anybody that's been churched? Where do you go to church? Well, I used to go to that one over there, but they churched me. And usually it's over some sin that the people did not approve of. Yeah, we get that feeling sometimes that somehow we got to clean it up. It's sort of like, how are you feeling? And you go, I feel miserable. I got a temperature. I just can't get my legs to work today because I'm so weak with a high temperature and and I don't know what to do. 
And, well, why don't you call the doctor? Well, uh, let me give it another day or two and uh, see if I feel a little better, and then I'll go. You want to feel a little better and then go to the doctor. You don't want to go to the doctor so you can feel a little better maybe today. No, I, I, I'm going I'm to do it my way. I'm going to wait till I feel better, and then, then I'll go. You know, that's how we do a lot of times in our faith, isn't it? We'll go to church when I sort of get my, my house in order. So we get this idea that we got to sort of, you know, so, so that we're not melted, you know, right there in front of everybody with a fire from heaven. We need to sponge those things in our life that are just, you know, that, that are questionable. That, where I've been living in the dark place. Because I'm scared to death that if I go to that church, somehow I will be exposed for who I really am. We don't like being exposed for who we really are, do we? That's why we hold on to secrets. That's why we're quiet in our sin. Because we don't want someone to bring it up or focus on us that, oh my goodness, it's, it's sort of like the Holy Spirit of God convicts me when I do wrong. He, he convicts me. I don't want to hear you talk about the very sin that I did wrong to my face. I just don't want to hear it. I want to hide it. I want it to be shoved away somewhere. Hey, grandsons. Well, the religious leaders, a lot of them, not all of them, their hearts had been corrupted. They had become religious, and they had to keep that, that reputation throughout the community, even if they had to put you down to do it. And they were very good at it. They were learned in the Scripture. They could... Pray publicly beautiful prayers. They could deflect any kind of truth with some kind of pretense of words and paragraphs or quotes. But the last thing they did not like about John and they did not like about Jesus was their words pierced them and exposed them for who they really were. So here we have this set up for us you can't justify yourself. You can't discredit those who speak the truth. That's what they were doing by criticizing John and Jesus. You've got to discredit the one that's speaking the words so that they, <laughs> they don't have any uh, influence on people. That's why they become so critical. John 3, chapter, I mean, John 3, verses 19 through 20 says this. This is the judgment. The light is coming to the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. And that, those two verses right there sort of explain what's going on with these religious leaders. John the Baptist is telling them to repent, Jesus is telling them about the kingdom of heaven and they just didn't want to be exposed for being the fraud that they are. Would that keep you away from church? Yeah, sure it would. If you were self-conscious about your own righteousness and you were trying to impress people that you're something that you're not, you don't want to go somewhere where you're going to be exposed, where the light will turn on. Now, let's get to the dinner. Here you have this Pharisee, Simon is his name, and he holds a, a dinner. Now, at that time period, folks, there were those times where a Pharisee would open up his entire house to the community, especially if there was a visiting rabbi coming in. Jesus was the visiting rabbi, 
And so the people in the community could just come to the house for that dinner. And it was sort of like a, an open invitation. So that explains how this woman that he described as a sinner got into the house. Because normally a Pharisee would not allow that. A Pharisee would say, no, 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 you're unclean. You cannot come into my home. And I certainly don't want you touching me. But yet she came into the house. And where did she go? But they had sat around this table. Now, it's not like tables like we have. They're about a foot high off of the ground. So the way you would sit at a table in that time is you would lean on your left arm. You would push your feet out behind you as you're leaning, and you would use your right to eat with. So this is why it makes sense when the Bible says she came and stood behind him. And then she began to cry when she walked into the room. She could not help herself. The tears flowed, and they just kept flowing. Chances are this woman had probably heard Jesus speak somewhere. Maybe she saw the miracles that he had performed with the blind man or the lame man. Maybe she had heard about him and had finally had the opportunity from a great distance because of who she was. And she was in the back and she was thinking, I've got to, I've got to talk to this man. This man's different. And she found out that he was going to be at Simon's house. And so she went in, hoping that maybe I can just get a glance of him. Maybe he, he'll catch my eye or I'll catch his eye if I'm lucky. And so she went in very discreetly and stood behind him. Now Simon, the host, saw all this. And when she started to cry, her tears fell off her cheeks onto the feet of Jesus. And there she bent down, and with her long hair, she wiped his feet with her hair. Isn't this a beautiful scene? And, and, and you know, it, it, it's just, I, and Simon saw this too. So now you have this woman who they classified in the Bible as a, quote, sinner. Well, all of us in here know that we're sinners, we all know that we've fallen short of the glory of God. But to be labeled at that time a, quote, sinner meant you were a really bad sinner. You were notoriously known throughout the whole community. You had not hidden it. You did not shuffle away in the dark places. You sinned openly in the light. And everybody knew it. You were a disgrace. A disgrace to your family. A disgrace to yourself. Does, does, doesn't she have any self-respect whatsoever? They might say. And yet here she is touching the feet of a rabbi. Simon's saying this is not permissible. You cannot do this. This is wrong. I've been around people, and I know many of you have too, that felt like the sin in their life was the worst sin that had ever been created on the earth. They would not come within a, a country mile of a Christian. They certainly would not walk in this church if they felt like they were going to be exposed and condemned and judged. How did they get that idea? Where did that come from? Think about it. It came from churches. They get this idea that somehow we're up here in this cathedral or this building and we are judging everybody. And so they wouldn't dare be that bold. And it's very sad because I think a lot of people stay away because of that very reason. It's a preconceived idea. It's sort of like thinking something is one way and you find out later that it wasn't that way at all. But yet this woman 
was desperately looking to do something, to find some change in her life. Her reputation was already scarred, so she couldn't mess that up any more than she already had. And so she goes in and then she wipes the feet of Jesus with her hair from the tears that had washed his feet. And then what did she, she do? She would anoint his head with a fragrant oil. Now, some people say, Who, what Mary is this? Is this Mary? Is this Mary Magdalene they're talking about? Oh, this is Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. No. The Bible doesn't teach either. Now, I actually thought it was talking about Mary Magdalene, because if you look in the other gospel stories, and, the, and you'll see the parallels of another episode of this, it was Mary. But it does not really tell us in Luke's gospel who this is. And that really doesn't matter. What matters is that she came in and she became more of a host to Jesus than the host. Because Jesus looked at Simon and he told him this story about these two debtors. One owed the man 500 denarii. A denarii, one denarii was probably one day's worth uh, of, of work, how much you would make in one day. Uh, 500 denarii would probably be equal to, uh, let's say, $85,000. 50 denarii would probably be uh, worth, say, 5000 And so the, the man that had given this money to these two different people decided after he realized neither one were going to be able to pay that back, he forgave their debt. Wow, that's how many in here love it when somebody forgives your debt? <laughs> you know, you know that mortgage thing? I'll just throw that away. Don't worry about it. We got it covered. You know, don't worry. You, you know, we, we, we forgive you for it. How many remember the, the story of, of the man that uh, was forgiven uh, you know, this great debt by the master of the house of this king. And then what did he do? He goes out and finds his friends who owed him far less, and he beat them up <laughs> and took their money. That you owe me. Now, that's not this story. This story, he is saying, which of the two is going to be more thankful and grateful? The one that gave much? Or the one that gave less? Well, Simon answered correctly, and he says, the one that owed the most, because his debt was greater. And what he did is he drew that Pharisee right in with a lesson that was talking about himself. And then he goes further, and he says, you know what? When I came into your home, I was your visiting rabbi. You didn't greet me with a kiss. Now, that might seem like an odd thing, but in the first century uh, Israel, it was not odd at all. You would take a, a brother would go to another brother when they would meet, and you'd put your hand on his shoulder, and you would reach over, and you'd kiss him on the cheek. It was a greeting. And not only that, people in that day, pretty much like how I wear sandals all the time, they wore them all the time. And their sandals were, didn't have Velcro. You know, they had straps, and then you have a sole, and you have a lot of dusty paths and streets. You have where a lot of livestock are walking along with human beings, and along a journey, your feet would get a little bit dirty. And so, as a good host, you would not only greet them with a holy kiss, you would then provide for them water, to wash their feet. And so Simon had not offered. Now, the woman had brought with her an alabaster jar, which is a jar that has a skinny neck. And it's made so that the, you only really open it one time and you would break the neck to get to the oil, the flow of the oil. And one of the things of a custom as a good host in that time was anointing someone's head with 
with a fragrant oil. You know, David said, uh, uh, I, He anointeth my head with oil. This was to, to refresh a person after maybe a long journey or a long day. Now, I know we're all thinking, what kind of shampoo do you use to get that oil out of our hair, you know? But they're not thinking like that. They're thinking about this wonderful fragrance, and it's sort of like we wash your feet, we meet you with a kiss, we have, you have a seat at the table where you can lounge, and you are going to be refreshed with this wonderful, good oil. The lady had done all three. The sinner had done all three. Have you ever met a sinner that seemed more like a saint than a saint than a sinner? Did that make any sense? You know, I, I, I was talking to somebody not long ago. You know, I know this guy down the road. He's an atheist. He doesn't believe in God. But he's more of a Christian than a lot of people I know. We go to church. And I'm thinking, well, he's an atheist. He doesn't believe in God. But yet, you're saying he's more of a Christian than those down the road that go to church? Boy, what kind of church is that? Well, you know, this woman was a sinner, well known. And she is touching, someone that's unclean is touching a rabbi, his feet and washing his feet. And she is in anointing him with this fragrant, very expensive oil. Those, th those things were expensive. You break the, head, uh, the neck of that bottle and start to pour it as an honor. What Jesus saw in her was something worth saving. Now he saw something in Simon worth saving. The difference was she came desiring it. He came pushing it away. She did not criticize Jesus. She held him up as something wonderful. He was trying to always find something wrong with what Jesus said or did. And that seemed to be a continued thing throughout his three years of ministry when he came up against certain religious leaders. Unlike Nicodemus, who was probably more of an exception, there were several others that admired him also. And they knew this man is different. He's not your typical rabbi. This guy, in all my learning from my lifetime, he fits all of the categories of Messiah. But you didn't say that out loud. That would not have been accepted. This woman acknowledged, I'm lost and I want to be found. I'm broken. I'm a sinner and, I, and I, I, I want to clean my act up. I want to get my life straightened out. Is that you? Is that who you are today? Are you the religious leader who is prideful? Who's trying to hide your sin in the dark places, and you don't want to hear the truth because the truth exposes you for who you are? Or are you willing to say, Lord, here is where I am. I'm lost, and I can't be found. I'm blind, and I do not see. I'm broken, and I need to be healed. See, that is when life changes for any of us. Every one of us who call ourselves a believer, a Christian, every one of us come at a point in our life that I call the defining moment. And that defining moment is when the Holy Spirit of God stirs your heart, exposes your sin, gives you an opportunity to make a change, and He forgives and He forgives, and He forgives. Some of us hold grudges, and we need to let that go. Because we're not hurting 
the person that we hold a grudge against. We are hurting our own selves, aren't we? We are exposing our sin more than theirs. What Jesus wants of you and me or anyone that walked into this church today, maybe you came with an agenda. Maybe you came without an agenda. Maybe you came to worship a holy and loving God and praise His name. Maybe you came because you're seeking and you're trying to find out, where do I go from here? How do I get there? Maybe I can go to church and the Bible will reveal it to me. Maybe somebody will change my life today. And then you get here and you hide in your pew because you know I'm talking to you. Now, I'm not specifically... If I was looking at you when I said that, I wasn't specifically <laughs> meaning you, okay? I've been accused of that so many times. My friends, change happens when we recognize the fact that it needs to happen. When the heart is stirred by the power of the Holy Spirit, not by a preacher, not by Him, not by another human being, but when the Spirit of God has that divine appointment set and you showed up, then there's a moment in your life where light has come to show you how to get out of your darkness. Is that you? Is that who I'm talking to right now? Someone that's desperately looking for that? To get things right? To wash the feet of Jesus with your tears? To embrace His feet with water? To love Him? To go to Him and ask forgiveness? To be made new and be made whole? You can't hide but so long. Because what you did not know before you got here, when I say this, the Holy Spirit sets up a divine appointment, is that the Spirit of God has been pursuing you for a long time now. And now is the day of salvation. Now is your day. You've been invited and you came. Now you need to listen. Oh Lord, forgive me. Oh Lord, change me. Oh Lord, let my pride get out of the way. Oh Lord, let me stop hiding in my darkness and let me find light so that I can see and I won't be blind, so that I can hear and know the truth, and it'll set me free. So that I can pray and trust that you are the one who forgives sins. See, Simon questioned him when he forgave this woman her sins. He will forgive yours too. There's nothing you have done or that you're doing that God cannot forgive you. And He desires to forgive you. He wants you to be set free of it once and for all. Not to hold on to it anymore. Not another day. Today is your day. Because you were invited by Him for this specific moment. Don't pass on that moment. He's not taking away your choice. You can still choose to walk out of here and put it off another day. That's an awfully dangerous game to play. See, if you're listening right now and your heart is strangely warmed, that's not me. I'll just get in the way. That's God. And He's speaking to you now. I want to invite you to respond. I want to invite you to do something about it, finally. I'm going to invite you to come. 
to stand or to kneel publicly in front of everybody and say, Lord, change my life. This ends today. Change my life. I'm not running anymore. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you beyond words that you were here before we arrived and that you have been waiting for us and that you know my name and you know everything about me and my life. I've hid absolutely nothing from you, for you know all things. And yet you see something in me worth saving, and I don't even see it in myself. So I've been running from you for a long time, but today I'm not going to run. I'm going to accept your offer. And I'm going to give my heart to you. I want my life to change, Lord. I'm tired and I'm weary. I'm tired of hiding in the darkness and running away from you. Today I'm going to not run away from you. I'm going to run to you. And I'm going to accept your love and your salvation. Give me the courage to stand up and to walk down there and say yes to the Savior of the world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn, I am thine, O Lord. Let's all stand and sing.
I turned my microphone off because I don't want to sing a solo in there. Um, thank you folks for coming to church today. I want to share a little personal story, a little something to send you with. You know how I told you that God has a, a plan and a defining moment of where you two will meet. You might be like the lamb that thought that the grass was greener on the other side and you've been grazing there for a while and you sort of poked your head up and you said, uh-oh, I don't even know where I'm at. I had a little incident last night, Reen and I did, where that very parable just came to light in a new way and, and, it, and it had to do with an animal. I know you're saying, that's strange. How many own a dog? Yeah. How many love your dog? How many will let your dog sleep on your stomach? <laughs> so your dog is turned, it's part of the family, right? Well, Reen and I have three dogs, and one of them is 12 years old, and he's blind. He's also a diabetic. So he has to have his insulin twice a day, and he has to be fed properly before you do that. I'm telling you this for a reason. It goes along with if you are that sheep and you're grazing in that field, there is a way home. Because last night when I got back from the hospital in Charlotte, I got back in about 6.30, I took the dogs out for a walk, and I always watch Boulder. He's the one that's blind, extra close, but he lost my eye, and I wasn't paying attention. Uh, actually, I was texting somebody a message. And uh, I looked up, and I saw the other two dogs and couldn't find the last one, and that was Boulder. And this is at nighttime. The sun has gone down, and he can't see in the daytime. And so he has to sort of feel his way, smell his way around. And I could not find him anywhere. Anywhere. And I went into a panic. And uh, so I'm going through the woods. I'm going to the lake. I'm crossing the streets. I'm all over the place. My neighbors saw me around there outside with my flashlight. So they came out. And then they say, you know, my neighbors joined in the hunt. And we're all hunting for over three and a half hours. And it is dark, and I'm imagining all these things that could have happened to him. And I finally just told everyone, y'all, thank you. We need to go in now. We need to call it. So we did. And I went into the house, and I sat there, and I said, Rena, I have got to take one more weep. I've got to try one more time to find him. The idea of him being alone out there in his condition is just is tearing me up. And so I jumped in the car and I didn't go right. I didn't go straight. I went to the one place that I kept getting this nudge to go. And I drove up the road went way far than, farther than he probably would have ever gone. And I was on my way back to the house, and I was praying, Oh, Lord, give me the eyes to see. Dead or alive, just give me the eyes to see where I can find him. If he's dead, I want to bury him. If he's alive, I want to take him home. Right before I'd done that, Lisa, our next-door neighbor, and her husband, Ken, we all circled together, and, and Lisa had a prayer for my dog. I don't know if you've ever prayed for your dog before, but I have. And um, on the way back home, 
right in the middle of the road, I saw a black little dog running right straight for the car. And he was a good distance away from the house. And man, I just slammed the brakes on, popped that door open, and I ran out and grabbed him. And then thanking Jesus, tears came to my eyes. I'm not much of a crier, but I cried. And I thanked him over and over. My friends, it's so clear to me how much God loves us. Now, you're not dogs. I understand that they're one of God's creatures. But He loves us so much that when we finally stop running and start running to Him, life changes. Death will not take us. Jesus will give us a new life. And He desires to give that to you. So I share this story with you. Not only am I happy, but I share it with you so that if you are at that place where you're trying to decide and you're doing a little running right now, I just implore you, listen to that voice. He'll show you how to find your way home. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.